Hey everybody, uh, Mark Glassetter here with Concept Agritech. Uh, today we are at Commodity Classic. Um, got Chris Weaver here with us, gonna talk a little bit about um, some high yield soybeans and managing that. Um, talk a little bit about soil tests and, and different things you're doing. So Chris, where are you out of? So I'm a sixth generation farmer from Finksburg, Maryland. Awesome, awesome. So. Most people, I would say, know you for your high yield soybeans. Obviously, I've been up to your farm. Know you can grow a little bit of corn too. So, um, talk about you know kind of how you're managing that high fertility program. Are you are you looking a lot at soil tests? Are you looking a lot at tissue tests? All of the above. How are you how are you starting that process? You know, because we're yes, we have a lot of different products that that we use and utilize, but really. We're trying to make custom approaches for guys. So how are you doing that for yourself, I guess? So kind of when we start farming a new farm or we start looking at things, we want our pH as close to seven as possible. We really focus on base saturations to start. I want to really drop the mag out. Um, I want to get my mag levels on base sats probably down to about eight. And I want to get my potash numbers increased. So I'm looking at a base saturation number on potash between five and six. Okay. I really am looking at calcium. Calcium is one of the most important things we look at next to potash, and I want that calcium between 80 and 85. So if we're not getting our PPMs on calcium at that time up around 2,000 plus on our soil sample, sure. then we have to really apply high cal lime, some gypsum. We need to be looking at other sources for the, for the lime part to get that calcium and potash right first, and then we can drop our mag out. Um, and th those are really the secrets to get started. Well, that's what we've seen too. I mean, we tell everybody you gotta have that base fertility, but then, you know, looking at some of these foliars and plant amendments and keeping that plant kind of healthy as possible. What, what are you doing there? Are you doing, you know, how are you looking at that? Vegetative going to reproductive, are there certain things you're, you're looking at doing without giving too much away as, as to what, what's giving you those yields? But uh, how are you approaching that and kind of keeping that plant how healthy throughout that whole growing season? So the secret to growing high yield in beans is very simple. Keep the cotyledon alive as long as possible. If you can get that cotyledon to go to R1, R3, you're golden. I know you can get over 100. Where can you go from there? I can't tell you. And but, that's, I mean, most guys are lucky to get to V3 and still have that cotyledon hanging on. So that's, that's definitely something that I think is worth noting there. So. It's very high management but you gotta start with fungicide early. Fungicide, okay. sugars, and humics. You know, your Carbon RX is perfect. Sweet Success is great because we're using gallons of that every time we're going out in the field. Every time we go through every single one of our passes, it's got Carbon RX, Sweet Success in it, and we're making sure that we're relieving the stress in the plant. We're being able to keep that cod leading alive. We'll start spraying fungicide as early as VE, V1, and we don't stop. We okay. might do multiple applications. You know, this year we introduced BioHealth to some of our um, treatments, we really saw a great success on frog eye, uh, powdery mildew, or uh, white mildew, yep. stuff like that. So we were really beneficial in be being able to bring some new products online. But when we start spraying fungicides, we start early and we start often. Okay. So we know a fungicide life between 15 to 20 days. So we know that every 15 days, we're gonna be hitting it with another fungicide to keep that plant healthy. Sure. So you talked a little bit about the humix and fulvix and sugars, you know, Often, I would say almost any time we talk with guys about getting a soybean program together, they're like, man, my soybeans are just lazy. They're just lazy. Talk a little bit about what that you know, extra carbon is doing there, I guess, and trying to gear really that plant more towards how a corn's gonna uptake nutrients, water management, all those things, so. So you bring up about talking about nitrogen. Let's start there first. I add a lot of extra nitrogen to our plant. Okay. Our plants wallow. I'm okay with that. I know that we're gonna have a lot of weight out there, we're gonna have test weight, we're gonna have big beans. So we, I'm already prepared for the wild one. So we're, when we go out to pre-spray, we're putting about 50 pounds to 70, 60 pounds of nitrogen out early. Now, what scares me with that is the salt. So the reason we're using the humix and the sugars is to start to buffer that salt. Plus, look at the sugar as a candy bar in the middle of the day, a Coke. Absolutely. Now we're creating more energy for that plant so we're taking the stress away from that plant and we're being able to put that towards energy in that plant so now that plant's getting up out of the ground and, and promoting now we're reducing the salt with the humix but the more humix and the more sugar we're doing we're also freeing up other nutrients that are in the ground that are bind up you know positive negative ions you got bird here that can get more scientific into that than absolutely I can. but now we're freeing up nutrients that are in the ground when we can start freeing up the nutrients that are already in the ground 
now we're being able to add foliar feed, we're being able to touch and do the little things that we need to do to touch up. But the base thing, and this is, look, Humix are a new technology that guys are just starting to hear about now or, you know, I got two 70 year olds, I heard the word snake oil a lot in my life. Absolutely. Growing. But the more Humix and sugar we use, the more increase in yield. We're reducing the stress on that plant. And those are really the two key secrets If anybody, once you get your soils right, that's the next step in where you need to go. And I know we've, <clears throat> don't know if you have any input there, but we've really seen a big difference in different types of humix and fulvics and sugars. A lot of people kind of want to lump all of those in the same, same area, but it's just like any other nutrient or, uh, you know, what it's derived from, that's, that's a big deal. I mean, have you seen any of that uh, so, in dealing with humix and fulvics and sugars? We've tested a lot of humix and fulvics through the years. You know, I kind of got complacent there for a couple of years, not looking for anything new. We thought we'd known the best. Got to meet you and Kyle along the way. And there was one thing that really led me to Carbon RX, and that was the amino acid. We were adding amino acids into our, into our products. And when I found Carbon RX, it had already had the amino acid in it. So now I had a humic product with the amino acid that took a step out. Amino acids are crucial for what we're doing in high yield bean production and corn. So once I got onto it, we, we made a full switch, I think that first year to Carbon RX, and we haven't looked back now for three years which is a phenomenal journey. Um, there are so many different humix and sugars. So a lot of companies will say, yeah, we have a humic. Don't worry about the price. I use gallons, not quarts, not pints, we use gallons. So when you're using gallons, I don't care about the price. I worry about the quality and the mixing. Carbon RX mixes, there's so many other products on the market that won't mix. But now we gotta talk availability in the soil. Just because you have a humic, doesn't mean it's available in the soil. Sure. So a lot of companies are saying, oh, we're available, we're not. You guys have to do testing. You have to look. Mix it in a container. Look at how it mobilizes throughout the plant. So one thing that we have found over the years with Carbon RX, because of the amino acid and the high quality humic um, that you're starting with, that it's a really readily available to the plant instantaneously versus a lot of the competitors on the market. So, so you mentioned one thing there that kind of caught my attention, you know, soil availability versus plant availability. Um, you know, obviously biology is a big part of what we do and talk about um, day to day. Um, you know, looking at, at those, what we would call biological catalysts. So your fulvics, your sugars, those food sources, um, those kind of all get lumped into one category as well when we're talking, so I think that's important you know, when, when we start talking about biologicals and, and educating people on biologicals of, okay, here's a true bacteria, fungi-based product that's gonna obviously work on making that nutrient available in the soil versus trying to promote something. You know, that's, that's something we definitely try to educate our growers on. And I know you've seen it firsthand too of, you know, you got people knocking your door down trying to look at stuff as, hey, I got a biological. It's like, well, do you or do you not? So. So on the biological side, we use a lot of different biologicals. Yep. And along the way, you know, I've always been a big component in feed what you already have in the ground first. And if your soils aren't healthy, you can't feed what's not there. So one of the quickest ways when I meet somebody new and I talk to them and I want to learn about them, I said, how does your planter pull? And they'll say, oh, well, it, it's pulling. I said, how, how many acres are you getting before you change it out this? What do you mean? I said, are you blowing black smoke when you're pulling it? Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, then your mag levels are super hot. So think about it like this. If that planter's pulling hard in the ground, are those biologicals able to move through that hard pan of that ground the same way? Now, what I can tell you is when you have healthy soils, we did a farm tour about two years ago, and the night before we did the tour, we got four inches of rain. And I thought it was gonna be catastrophic. Total waste, we couldn't take people out in the field. That next day, we had everybody out in the field. We were able to walk through the ground, but the biggest takeaway everybody came back from is when they went in that muddy ground, their shoes didn't go in as a size 10 and come out a size 15. <laughs> so they came out being the same size and they said to me, how is this? And so we got all of our base saturations right, we got our biology right, our, our soils are healthy. Sure. So as we're looking at this, there are so many products to help. You know, the one cool thing was meeting with you and talking with Kyle, We've added a bunch of bugs and BioVate to our, our mix. And sure. you know, I learned that you have to feed the bugs too. You just can't throw one in. But that bunch of bugs is really helping now to help lower my mag out of my soil. And that was a real big push for us because you know, I already said I want my base sats down to about eight. 
which, on that. Which is probably typically lower than what most people are looking at. You know, when uh, I'll be honest, a lot of times when we're looking, it's 10 to 12. So that's that's an interesting piece there that you wouldn't typically hear. So that's that's good to know. What about so we we've, we've kind of talked about the early progression. I mean, when you get into reproductive phase, I mean, we talk about all the time trying to keep those beans as happy as possible during reproductive time. I mean, how does your management style change? I mean, are you are you really getting in them a lot more at reproductive time? Are you staying out of certain areas or how are you handling high yield soybeans during reproductive times? So we run a lot of tram lines. So we'll go through beans as many times as we need. We'll pull out tissue samples, whatever that bean needs, we'll feed it. If that means we need to go through with a potash application, Look, when it comes to tissue samples, I want to keep all my numbers up. Sure. Um, I'm not worried about the mag as much. I want to keep my calcium up, my potassium levels up. The main reason is that's water movement. That's nutrient movement throughout that plant. And once I know um, potassium, if it gets below three, I know I've already lost. If I can't keep my calcium above one, I'm in rough shape for the rest right. of the year. So I don't want any of these numbers to drop. We have so many spreadsheets over the years to set up base set our baselines where we know, hey, we're getting issues. The, I tell you, one of the products this year that I really love is Cowboy. Yep, that's been and a that, good one. That's going to give it a game changer. What we've had in beans in the past is we couldn't keep our boron levels up. So we've been mixing it with different things. You know, you use calcium carbonate, something like that. We weren't getting the results that we wanted for years. This year with Cowboy, I didn't, you know, I know I went above Bert's recommended rates, okay? And I know Bert had a heart him. attack. No, yeah. no, don't tell him. Yeah. But I know when we wanted to go in and we wanted to push the label, we were going above recommended rates and we were getting responses on our boron. Look, we were in a drought. From August to there, our southern ground, we had to take crop insurance for the first time in our life because of how bad the weather was. Sure. But when you can add products like Cowboy or Purple Passion out there, we're able to keep our calcium as well as our potassium up. And, and our numbers are staying Absolutely. there. Absolutely. We're seeing better water movement. Look, we did 158 bushel beans. We're at 1,400 on seed size. This year, doing 122 bushel, we do marbles. We were at 1625 Jeez. on seed size. Okay, it's not about test weight. I've never grown 60 pound test weight beans. I'm between 57 and 80. 80, okay. I think. Uh, sorry, 57 and 80. 57 and 58. The best we ever did was 58.5. Okay. I've never hit 60. And if somebody has, I want to meet them because I want to learn something that, that they can teach me. Because that's kind of the opposite of the corn side. We're trying to pack weight and pack kernel weight. You know, that's that's what's I, given us a lot of yield. 62 pound test weight corn's not hard to do in this day and age. Right. Um, but I can tell you, you know, I always laugh. How are we getting 15,000 bushel out of a 10,000 bushel bin? It's because we're pulling out 65 pound test weight corn. Sure. It's not yeah. hard to do. Yep. But when we can keep our boron up and our calcium up and our potassium up, now we're looking at the next evolution in microbes. And that's really where I'm excited to be with you guys. We need to start looking at our nickels, our cobalts, our mollies, you know, the, the products we haven't focused on. And that's where, you know, some of your other products coming online, I'm really getting excited where we're going to head to the future. You know, one of my main goals is I want to be the first farmer of 200 bushel no-till non-irrigated. There you we go. hit 170. We've gotten there undocumented, but I want to make sure we're at 200 before anybody else. Well, that's, I, I think there's something to be said there. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, with growers that, hey, we don't care what the yield goal is. So you've, you've hit the 140, 150 bushel soybeans, but you're still, still looking for that next bottleneck. I mean, that's really, I think what we try to do on a, on a day-to-day -day basis is figure out what that bottleneck is. Oh yeah. <laughs> got, got cowboy Usually coming in here. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but no, I mean, that's, that's, I think, very, kind of speaks to you and, and pushing that, you know, you're looking for that, that next little bit of yield. So what, what would you say, so we talk about it in corn, you know, trying to, trying to go from like 250, 260 to 300 seems like, you know, a mile long race. I mean, what would you say that threshold in soybeans is? So I'm gonna tell you this, I always laugh you bring up corn first. I always laugh when I watch guys went from 250 two years ago, and now they're at 350 bushel, and they did 100 bushel in less than two years. I know that can't be right, because I only go up about 20 bushel increases. Um, I've got friends along the way that tell you the same damn thing. These guys that are increasing 100 bushel increments at a time and never go backwards, come on. We've grown 170 bushel, and then I grew 140, 136, and 122. I've gone backwards. Sure. In weather. three years, I mean, I'm going yeah. back. It's weather. It's so many different variables and factors. 
And I look at these guys that never have a bad year, and I'm sitting there going, Mark, I want to farm there. Yeah. this year. Okay, <laughs> so I'm very honest and open. Our southern ground was drought stricken, but these guys that are saying every year is a good year, <laughs> I like to farm where they farm yeah. because we do have economic problems. We do go backwards. Look, I've never had a yield where I went up and then I went up the following year. We always go back. A lot of that is, and I, and I always make this joke, we, hit a, we did the 160 bushel and then we went back down to 136. I say it was my arrogance that got in the way. When you hit those kind of numbers, all of a sudden you go, damn, I did it. Now I'm gonna do the same program next year and we're gonna hit it again. And God always has a way of coming back and going, huh. Thought you, you had it, yeah. yeah. So I've learned to be humble and I've learned, look, we have to give the nutrients to the plant as the plant needs it, and I don't know everything, okay? I am not successful. I am successful because the team I have around sure. me. Sure. Yep. All right, I have you guys. I have my seed advisors. I have a grok seed. I have so many great team members on our team. I got Nathan, my dad, Uncle Tom. You know, we have arguments. You know, one of my favorite things this year was I had a gentleman named Bert in our shop and Bert's telling me use rates. I'm laughing because if he said a quart, I'm going a gallon. Yeah, we're pushing it. If yeah. he says a gallon, I'm going five gallon. Okay, so I know the first time I told Bert what rates we were using, that he was having a heart attack all the way down to Mississippi. About fell out. Oh yeah. my God, I heard the yelling from Mississippi all the way to Maryland. <laughs> but I'm telling you, if you're not, if you want to increase yield, you got to get out of the quarts and the pints and you got to go to gallons. Sure, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, so you, you mentioned something that's obviously been a been a hot topic. So drones, you know, yeah. how, is that going to change anything for your high yield soybeans? I mean, do you see maybe even pushing the envelope even a little bit more just by having those drones or what what's your thought process there, I guess? So we invest a lot in technology every year um, since I be, it took over as president of the corporation. I, I believe in spending money in technology every year. So. One of the big secrets was last year we had a high wind. July 12th last year was a game changer for us. We got a straight line wind, 90 miles an hour. We got Goss's wheel. We got damage unbelievable. We got a drought. The one thing I couldn't do quick enough was get the helicopter in the air. That made me mad. So one of my biggest slogans is control the control. If I can't control it, then I'm not in charge of it. I was so mad that I couldn't get that drone up in the air last year, that, or the helicopter. I went and bought a drone. So now I have a drone set up with a box truck, set up with a 550 gallon nurse tank where I can get out and I can spray when I need to. I got two young boys separate from the boys that helped me on spraying. That are, all they're dedicated to do is, a, that drone is gonna be dedicated insecticide, fungicide, and fertility. So now we can get out there and we can add extra passes on these beans and I think that's gonna be the step that gets us to 200 bushel. That's awesome. That's awesome. We're kind of wrapping up, I mean, uh, you know, those are definitely some good things to think about. I mean, probably some of them a little bit different than, than what most people are hearing out there. So I think I think we all appreciate you taking the time to no, give like us a little bit of yeah. nugget there that we might, might can learn something from. So.